Okay, I want to talk to y'all just a little bit today about Godzilla. No, I mean, I want to talk to y'all today about radiation units and measures. Of course, Godzilla is related to this because uh, he was originally created as a, as a depiction of radiation's effects on Hiroshima and Nagasaki through the use of atomic bombs. Um, of course, Hollywood whitewashed all of that. But um, what I really want us to look at today is just considering uh, maybe a, a slight metaphor of Godzilla um, but largely, we'll probably think more about the sun and how it relates to uh, ionizing radiation exposure. So here's the learning objectives I've identified. I want to look at some SI units of measure for radiation, calculate a dose area product, talk about uh, equivalent doses and effective doses, uh, be able to calculate a cumulative uh, lifetime dose limit, talk about a genetically significant dose, which might be the more, most complicated thing we look at today, and then talk about various uh, detection instruments. And finally, even though it's not in the textbook, which the textbook I'm referring to is Radi Radiography in the Digital Age, the third edition by Quinn Carroll. Um, I want to look at occupational dose limits, even though it's not in this chapter. So exposure. Um, I always just think about um, like light in air is, is an exposure. So like if I expose a photographic film, I've, I've captured some of that light. Um, so here's Tesla. I think this was around the time that he like ran off to Colorado and did some kind of crazy. He's trying to build a death ray or something. But... Um, exposure just is a measure of the intensity of radiation in the air. So the amount of ionizations that produce an electrical charge, it's measured in coulombs per kilogram, which is uh, the amount of charge produced in a kilogram of air. Um, so if we want to really nerd out on this, we would say that exposure is the total electrical charge in one sign, either all pluses or all minuses per unit mass at x-ray or gamma ray photons with the energies up to three million electron volts generate in dry non-humid air at standard temperature uh, 22 degrees celsius at pressure of or one atmospheric sea level so this is basically a very very precise um, scientific measurement and we do not use it all that much in all honesty because it is so precise but i think about this as like if i walked outside this is the amount of like sunlight that's in the air at any given moment air kerma is actually translating that to the body, the concentration on the body's surface. So it's like it's relating exposure now to organic systems. So um, air kerma is is what we generally kind of think about things. We we tend to think about things in a simplified way, and air kerma is kind of what stands in for exposure. We we use it widely to describe an entrance skin exposure. So if I walk outside and there's there's sunlight, this is the amount of sun that's like striking my skin. The exposure, as it were, to my skin. So it's different from exposure, but we, we kind of like draw a kind of a, an equal sign between them. So we have air kerma as a way to like stand in for how much exposure is occurring on the surface of the patient or the radiographer's body. Um, and it's gradually kind of replacing these traditional quantities of exposure. Um, so we, we used to see things expressed in Rankin and we're seeing that less and less. Um, so it denotes that we've calculated what the radiation intensity was in air, and then we've just translated it to that surface. And no one really knows what kerma means, like kinetic energy released in matter, kinetic energy released in material, blah, 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 blah. All right, exposure area product. Um, so again, we're borrowing from air kerma now, you can see, because we're expressing this in gray, and that should be um, centimeters squared. It just, it, when it pulled over to explain everything, it did that funny too there. So it's, it's gray centimeters squared. Um, and this is a measure of how much of the body was exposed to radiation. So um, gray centimeter squared is going to just tell us what the amount of exposure was to a specific location. So it's, it's putting it over a ge geometrical location, not invisible Tokyo. Absorbed dose is going to tell us a little bit about like what, okay, now what actually happened in that organic system? What what was the biological impact of the exposure? So this would be like, if I was thinking about it, I walked outside, I got some sun on my skin. This is telling me a little bit about like how red I could expect to get because I do not tan at all. Um, so this is a quantity or amount of energy per unit mass absorbed by an irradiated object. So you can see this is uh, the special unit, the gray, um, which is one joule per kilogram. And in this case, I'm talking about kilograms of tissue. So before when I was talking about exposure, I was talking about kilograms of air. Um, now, as I'm talking about absorbed dose, I'm talking about kilograms of tissue, tissue of the body. So it's responsible to, for any biological damage. Um, the sunburn that I would receive is going to be an, ex an, an example of absorbed dose. Of course, some parts of the body can handle more radiation than others. So, for example, um, muscle tissue is fairly radio-resistant, whereas gonads are fairly radiosensitive. 
The dose area product just tells us like what is the sum of the air coma over an exposed area of the patient's body. And this is a very, very important measure um, for us. We are using this increasingly in radiology to kind of have an idea of what the field size was. And so um, it's just kind of reinforces that, reinforces that idea that we need to be collimating on all of our exposures. All right, a radiation weighting factor is necessary because not all radiation sources are created equal. So a radioactive source like an alpha particle has a much higher impact on a biological system than a gamma ray or an x-ray. And so we have a way of expressing that and we will use this when determining an equivalent dose. So an equivalent dose just takes different weighting factors and then makes them equivalent across different, uh, across different exposures. Um, so this is important, uh, basically it's a dimensionless factor that allows us to compare between different types of radiation exposures. Um, it used to be called a quality factor. So this is what we're going to use to calculate an equivalent dose. So textbook page 719 talks about how um, this is the product of the average absorbed dose in a tissue or organ in the human body um, when we associate it with a weighting factor um, for the radiation types. So we could be exposed to like gamma rays and alpha particles and the equivalent dose is going to take the dose, whatever the dose was in amount in, in gray, times a weighting factor for um, alpha particles or times a weighting factor for gamma rays. And we'll get an equivalent dose that's going to now be expressed in sieverts. Um, so I don't have that on this. Oh yeah, I do. The subunit is the sievert. So we just moved from gray to sievert just by applying a weighting factor. We can also apply tissue weighting factors, and so this is allowing us to consider that different parts of the body respond to radiation differently. Like I mentioned earlier, some parts of the body are more radio uh, sensitive, like the top of this uh, table here. This comes from our textbook that we'll use for radiation biology, which is radiation protection in medical radiography on El Sevier. I think it's like edition eight. Um, really, really helpful textbook. Um, but this just looks at how not all parts of the body are, are, are created equally. So um, one thing that's really important for us to consider is that we're simplifying things considerably. So if I was talking to a health physicist and I asked them, well, what was the patient's dose? They would ask me like their dose to what? And what they're asking for is like, well, what part of the body are we interested in? Because for example, like the chest x-ray has a very, very limited dose to the, thought, to the gonads, but has a significant dose to the lung. And so we have to be specific on what area of the body we're referring to um, and also consider how those different tissues respond to radiation differently. And that's precisely what the effective dose is designed to do. I think about this dose as telling me what the effect of the radiation was on my body. So it provides a, the best measure for the overall risk of exposure to ionizing radiation. And the NCRP report number 116 defines it as the sum of the weighted equivalent doses for all irradiated tissues. So we have to have the equivalent dose in order to calculate the effective dose. Um, we also need to have the tissue weighting factors, which no one will ever expect you to memorize because it's this giant phone book of different uh, tissues in the body and how they respond to. Generally, we, we simulate these things out using a computer. So, but if I was going to get down and dirty with it and just ask, well, how do I calculate this effective dose? Then I would take the dose in gray, so the absorbed dose in gray, multiply it by the weighting factor for the radiation and, and then the weighting factor for whatever tissue. Um, so, for example, I could give an absorbed dose or an effective dose to the gonads, for example. I'd need the absorbed dose to the gonads in, uh, in gray, multiply that by the tissue weighting factor, so, or, or the radiology, the radiologic weighting factor. So, um, what, was I, what was I exposed to the gonads? So, was it, was it gamma rays? Was it x-rays? Was it alpha particles? And then the tissue weighting factor specific for the gonads. All right, switching gears just a little bit, I want to talk about personnel monitoring exposures. And one of the first things I want to point out, if you look at the back of your badge, your OSL, you do not have this little yellow packet on the back, the neutron component optional CR-39. Um, so what that means is that this, your badge is mostly designed, it's primarily designed for detecting x-rays and gamma rays, right? Um, it is not good at detecting neutron contamination or anything like that. Um, so that's pretty standard for us in x-ray. No, generally, the only time you see these neutron component would be like if you're working in a power plant. But this is the OSL, kind of the layout of what we see on the outside of it. This is used to make sure that occupational exposure limits are, are kept well below the annual effective dose limits. And generally, these are given to any radiation worker or occupationally exposed individual who's expect to, expected to receive 10% or more 
of the, uh, the annual occupational dose limit, which is 50 millisieverts. So five millisieverts or more, you need to be wearing one of these. So there again, it's just reinforcing that. Um, I also got in a tr expressed in a traditional unit of measure here, the rem. Um, pretty much can ignore that. I don't know if the if the registry will have that unit. We just need to focus on these SI units. So there's the um, effective dose that I'm talking about. Um, generally, though, uh, facilities will give these to people who are receiving doses far less than that 10% uh, range, just to play it safe. So what are the purposes? Why do we wear these things? Well, the main reason is that it's going to give us an idea of what our working habits are and working conditions are for the imaging personnel. For example, I worked at an imaging facility where we did a lot of cross table lateral hips and post-operatively, and uh, the facility was such that we had to like hold the cassettes for the for the for the post post op hip, and I had a pretty hot month. I was holding the cassette a lot, and my manager could basically just say, "Don't do that. Like it's it's affecting your dose report. Um, figure out a way to switch out with other people." Um, so this allows us to kind of look at dosimetry over a period of time. So um, we. The NCRP and others that are there to kind of make sure that we're not uh, overexposing ourselves to radiation have come up with dose equivalent limits, and these are just based on whole body dose limiting organs, like for example the gonads, uh, the red bone marrow, and the lens of the eyes. In fact, most OSL dose reports are given um, as like lens of the eyes and the deep tissue dose just for this purpose. Okay, cumulative effective dose limits are basically just, you take a person's age and years, so like if a person was 36 years of age, um, we multiply that by 10 millisieverts, and then they would say, we'd say they've got 360 um, millisieverts. They should not exceed that in terms of like their overall cum cumulative dose. Like to, that's like to everything. Like, you know, they're lived by a power plant, they are got radon in their basement, all of that. They should not be uh, uh, consistently exceeding that. Um, and it gives us an idea of, for us, as who are occupationally exposed individuals, you know, how to best manage our dose. The ICRP, the International Council of Radiologic Protection and Measures, does even more with that than the NCRP does, but we are, here in the United States of America, we like to do things differently. Genetically significant doses are, uh, like I said before, one of the more complicated things that we will think about today. Um, the textbook kind of talks about it as, the gonadal dose that if it was given to every individual would cause the same genetic effects in the population as the existing distribution of radiation. In other words, um, it's an average quantity that gives us an indication of how much genetic harm is being caused to the entire human population due to the use of medical radiation. Now, um, I've also heard about it talked about in different ways than that. Um, the textbook says that currently it's estimated at 200 millisieverts annually. Um, there is also a, a separate genetically significant dose that is um, we'll, we'll explore next year. And I'll just leave it at that. But basically, these genetically significant doses, and the reasons why we do these types of calculations is just to reinforce um, the idea of keeping things as low as reasonably achievable, ALARA. All right, let's talk about characteristics of radiation devices. First off, Anytime we're trying to sense radiation, the first thing that we need to consider is how sensitive is the device. Is, is it able to detect small amounts of radiation exposure? Um, is it able to catch um, radiation exposures that are not very spread out but are kind of clumped together? Um, does it have any risk of kind of amplifying the exposure, making it look larger than it actually was? What's the accuracy of it? And this is the precision with which the measurements are obtained. Um, so we're very interested in things being... Um, accurate because it's the primary factor for determining the reliability of the measurement. The resolving time is like there's a minimum time that has to elapse between ionizations in order for the device to detect it. This is especially true with like Geiger counters. Um, there has to be some small amount of time that, that elapses before we can detect another ionization. Um, and so we actually have to calculate that for the different types of meters that we use. And then finally the range it just gives us a sensitivity of the detective instrument. So, um, and it has to be matched to the intensity levels of the radiation. So this goes back to what I was saying earlier about if your badge doesn't have the little yellow pa packet on the back, it can't detect um, neutrons. Another way of saying that is, is it doesn't have a range in which to detect neutrons. Neutrons are out of its range. So we saw this um, particularly when we looked at the poisoning of uh, 
Uh, Alexandre Luchekov, he was a, a double agent. Uh, KGB poisoned him, or they believe that the KGB poisoned him with um, a radioactive substance. And I don't remember the name of the substance that was placed in his tea. This was about five years ago, or maybe longer. And um, he, they, they called this the, the, the most dangerous autopsy in the world, it was conducted by Scotland Yard, trying to figure out how this guy was dying. He ultimately died of a heart attack in the hospital. He was very, very radioactive. But initially, they could not detect the radiation coming off of him because it was alpha particles, and they didn't have a detection equipment to, to catch that range of energies. Um, you can look that up in the news. So just Russian spy poisoned with radioactive tea, and you'll, you'll read all about it. It's very interesting. All right, so considering different types of detection equipments, one of the first that the textbook mentions is a scintillating detector, and so we use these quite a bit as well counters in nuclear medicine. These are used exclusively for gamma and x-rays. They um, can, they're very sensitive to things like background radiation, so you have to like calibrate them to the background radiation, and they can be influenced by things like magnets. But basically what you have is a crystal that glows in the presence of radiation. It's fed through a photomultiplier and then read out. It's got a bunch of lead shielding around it too because it's so sensitive. The good old OSL is our favorite. Um, so we use this a lot around departments because they're affordable and, and easy to read out. Basically this has a crystal and material aluminum oxide inside of the detective. Inside of the detector it's got um, an open window, a copper filter, and a tin filter. And these basically give different um, depths to which the radiation dose may have received. So like the open window is telling us a tissue skin dose. The copper filter is telling us a deep tissue dose, and the tin filter, I believe, tells us like lens of the eyes. Um, and the way it works is the radiation interacts with the aluminum oxide, changes the crystal structure. Then when it's read out, it's scanned with a laser, and it gives off optical light in response to that laser stimulation, and that optical light is then measured and plotted on a, gl a glow curve in order to kind of uh, give a range of, of what... Um, type of exposure that individual may have received um, and yeah we can also estimate half value layer off using the um, using the tin and the copper filter comparisons that's on pay, textbook page uh, 730 so these should be worn at the collar level outside of the lead apron if in the, in the event that a uh, technologist declares pregnancy, a declared, uh, they'll receive a second monitor. That monitor needs to be worn at the waist level beneath the lead apron. It basically simulates um, the dose received by the fetus, which again, what we're saying is the fetus is at risk of receiving 10% or more of the annual occupational dose of 50 millisieverts, i.e. 5 millisieverts. Um, so they need to be issued a monitor. Extremity dosimetry is generally done using a thermoluminescent dosimeter. Um, and so this has a special kind of crystal inside of it, which, uh, when exposed to radiation, it traps, uh, changes the crystal structure and it can be read out by heat. So we heat it up, it gives off light in the presence of heat, and then it is plotted against a glow curve to determine what type of radiation dose was received by the extremity. Um, we like these because, uh, they're kind of rough and tumble, the, the TLD. And so it, you know, if the hand is, you know, moving around a lot and bump, getting bumped, it's not going to affect the sensitivity of this device. I'm going to skip right over film badges because they are way old school and I have honestly never even worked with them. Uh, but I do want to talk about the Pancake GM detector. So a gas filled detector. Um, the textbook talks about this a little bit. Basically with a with this we have a a gas filled detector. A lot of times it's filled with argon gas or bromine and the radiation passes through the gas, it ionizes the gas, and then the electrons are drawn towards a positively charged anode. Each electron that strikes the anode is read out. So this sounds kind of similar to the way that um, an x-ray tube works, right? It has an anode, attracts electrons, but in this case, instead of like creating x-rays, this is detecting them. Um, so the anode is just used for readout, and it's also made out of tungsten, interestingly enough. The final thing that I want to leave you with is just these NCRP dose limits from uh, NCRP report number 116. These are important. Just memorize them all. They're all important. Uh, so um, thank you all so much and have a good day.